It's no secret physical and mental activity helps stave off age-related illnesses. This year, UBC has been conducting some new studies that suggest we should not only run around the block and do more puzzles, we should lift a few more weights and invest in strength training. Dr. Max Sinatter is an expert in the sensory cortices, dealing with vision and audition. He is the director of the Brain Research Center at UBC, and it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Max Sinatter back to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you, Fanny. It's great to be here. Nice to see you again. Okay. Aging and cognitive decline. Does everybody decline when well, they age? Well, on average, things do Pretty go much. south. <laughs> I'm afraid <laughs> things do go south. But not everybody, you know? So some people, you know, make it into their 90s and they, mm -hmm. they have their marbles and they're still in good shape. But on average, the process of cognitive decline actually starts in your 20s. And even the average 40-year-old has a little slower reflexes than a 20-year-old, a little bit, you know, not quite as good uh, a memory. And it just sort of slowly goes down. But that's the average. And, uh, you know, there are just some people who, who don't decline. And actually, there are some parts of your cognition that don't decline. So things like your vocabulary, uh, what I call wisdom, mm -hmm. um, your ability to see the forest rather than the trees, all of those capacities actually go up, and they keep going up into your 80s. And some people I know have uh, stellar memories. Yes. Uh, somebody you went to high school with will say, do you remember in grade 9 when you yeah. were wearing those That's shoes mm -hmm. and uh, your ponytail was in a knot or I something know, you I think... Know. How do you remember that? I, know. How I don't do they even do remember that? I was in How grade nine. That? Well, you know, what you may not, I don't know whether you've heard of this, but there's now a group of people that have been identified that have essentially perfect autobiographical memory. Hmm. So they remember, you know, all that, you know, and they, but they also remember the next day, they remember the shoes you were wearing the next week. And it's very, very interesting. We're now starting to study these people because we can now look in their brains while they're being asked to remember, you know, what mm -hmm. happened on that day in 1975. Mm -hmm. And we can now study not only what parts of the brain become active when those people with spectacular memories are recalling things, but we can also now see the wires. We can see the pathways and we can see, okay, this part is active and it's also at this moment, while he's thinking about this, he's, it's connected to these other parts. And so we're actually able, this is an example of at some level what you might want. Mm -hmm. uh, in this perfect memory person, this is the pattern. And you know what else is happening now? We're able to actually look um, at their genes, you know, the Human Genome Project, mm. we haven't actually seen the benefit yet of the Human Genome Project. The first genome was sequenced in uh, 2001, mm -hmm. okay? But the first human genome is like having the first fax machine. <laughs> you know, it's not actually all that useful. Right. You gotta have like a thousand or two thousand genomes so you mm -hmm. can start to see what's the average. And now we're going to be in a position where we can look at what are the genetic propensities, what are the genetic variants that lead this person to have a perfect memory. In our center now, we're working on a new chip. It's called a synapse chip, and it has the genes of the synapse. The synapse is where two neurons connect to each other, mm -hmm. where they kiss and talk to each other and communicate. And there are about 500 genes that are found there and only there. And we think that by looking at the variations in those 500 genes, which we can now do all at once for 100 bucks, right. we can say, okay, this is why this person, Amazing. This is why this person has such so a great So can memory. we look at our own families and say, my grandfather mm -hmm. remembered everything, my grandmother too, so yeah. that means I will. I hope so. Certainly your odds are better. Mm -hmm. Well, they remember the bad things for sure. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, Remember it, when you tied your sister up. Yes, I do. I, yes, you do. <laughs> but, but it is interesting that there is such a variation uh, across people. Mm -hmm. And if we can understand, you know, looking at the outliers is actually a very good thing to do. The people who are great and then the people who are terrible are also interesting because right. you can say, what's the difference between mm -hmm. those two? What's the difference in the brain images? What's the difference in the genetic horsepower that they've got at their synapses? And, you know, it's, it's actually an opportunity that we never had before. When it's a major event, 9-11. Yes. Uh, John F. Kennedy uh, assassinated. Yeah. There is a rare bird that would not remember that who was alive at the time. Absolutely. And 
that's true because one of the things that helps to stamp in memories um, is emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. Getting excited, getting focused mm -hmm. is really one of the most powerful ways you have of remembering. It just okay. juices everything up in your cortex at that moment. I was and in an economics class in university when John F. Kennedy was shot. I remember the professor's name. Uh -huh. I remember exactly what I uh -huh. did. I remember the campus. I remember yeah. what no, uh, the, the girls back at the sorority house said. Yeah. Uh, and and I, today, I remember that. Why? We can look in the brain and we can watch uh, what happens when you kick up the emotional state. Like mm. when you generate that jolt of adrenaline. Actually, adrenaline and noradrenaline, its cousin, they enhance the firing of neurons in your cortex. And so um, the way the brain works is that strong stimuli are remembered. Mm. Okay? And a stimulus can be made s stronger, can be made more salient to you by pairing it with emotions. And so it's actually... Um, so if, if you learn something and you just learn it and nothing's going on, you know, mm -hmm. I find like when I'm excited about something, when I'm like learning a new area of research or, you know, interested in, very interested in something, it just flows into me. I can just suck it up. And that's because I've got all this adrenaline flowing. I've got all this emotion coming into it. And that's, that helps you to categorize things that makes the signal physically bigger. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something else that's pretty interesting you can actually do the opposite. You can weaken memories. So like there's evidence, for instance, that if you give something like a, a beta blocker, you know, there's a drug called propanolol. It's an old style beta blocker. If you give that to somebody a couple of hours, within the first couple of hours after they learn something, so you meet me, I'm Max, mm -hmm. and somebody gives you a hit of propanolol, it blocks your blood pressure, uh, it blocks certain kinds of uh, adrenaline receptors, you won't remember me very well. Really? So, so vegging you out will mm -hmm. weaken your memory just as juicing you up will strengthen your memory. And is there a way to erase bad memories? Say you were a prisoner of war and you had some terrible time, some terrible trauma. I doubt you ever forget it. Can you erase it? Can you, you can, take it away? You can weaken it. Weaken it. You can weaken it. And it's actually interesting because it comes back to what I just said about this uh, propranolol. And, de-emotionifying, is that a word? Well, anyway, de-emotionifying the memory. You said it. You're the brainiac, I'm sure it is. <laughs> I hope so. Um, well, one of the things that has turned out to be really interesting now is it turns out that every time you retrieve an old memory, you actually make it new again. So you, it, it isn't like you just you know, pick it up mm. off a tape recorder. You bring it up, you bring the file up, and then you edit it again on the fly. Mm. This propranolol stuff, this, um, it only works for the first couple of hours after the memory, so it won't work on an old memory. But if you call it up again, then you reconsolidate, and then it's again vulnerable. So let's say you're trying to remember, or you're trying to forget you know, your time in Iraq, or in my case, all those women that have dumped me over the years. I hate them all. <laughs> but uh, so let's say I'm trying to forget something. Okay, somebody's dumped you, and, and okay. you're still mad, or you're, or you're sad. Or you're sad. Your heart's broken, yeah, your perhaps. Your heart's broken, and, and you want to weaken that memory or get rid of it. So what you do is you show the person, you know, the tank in Iraq or the mm -hmm. girl you used to love. Right. And that calls up the memory, and then you give them this propranolol and it weakens that memory and you do it again the next day Interesting. and it doesn't doesn't get rid of it entirely but you do the thing okay. you do it again the next day you give them something like that. and there are like several different ways of of weakening the memory you know, so there's a drug that can do it um, we're actually teaching people to suppress memories and it's interesting because people can learn how to do mm -hmm. this and then what we can do is we can watch in the brain while they're learning to suppress these memories, and we can say, you know what, maybe we, if we just exercise those pathways, the memory suppression pathways, we can improve their ability to suppress, and you can do that too. Well, thoughts are real forces, as you Absolutely. know. Uh, if somebody lingers in your mind, he or she, she. in your case, yeah. is always there. Yeah. And some days they're more there than others. What's going on inside your head? Well, you know, your thoughts are modulated by your emotions. Mm. So you can, like, your, even your perceptions are modulated by your emotions. So we know that 
apples look redder when you're hungry. They do? Oh, they do, absolutely. You can do studies on how red <laughs> is this apple, and you take somebody, right. you give them lunch, and the apple looks less red. They just look better. They just look better, and the same thing with women when you're in a certain state, mm. and, you know, and all kinds of other things, and uh, even, uh, you know, drinks, uh, you know, taste better when you're, you know, you, if you're an alcoholic and you really need sure. a drink. Mm -hmm. So um, emotions modulate your sensory processing, and they modulate your memory as well. And so it's all part of the mm. same, it's all part of the same thing. Okay, so say you're playing a, a, a golf game. Okay. And you're up at the first tee and you shank it and mm -hmm. embarrass yourself and mm -hmm. can't even, you know, yeah. get over it. <laughs> so you take a mulligan. You take now a mulligan. my instructor says, yes. if you screw up on the first hole, yeah. go back to your bag and start again. Yeah. Like even put your driver back in your bag yeah. Yeah. Do the routine, yeah. and somehow your brain gets the idea that this is a whole new game. Well, I think that's exactly right. You know, what you want to do is not get trapped um, in a rut mm. of repeating bad behaviors. So you want to take a break. You want to sort of wipe that page a little bit. You want to try to suppress that. Time is one thing you can do. Distracting yourself is another thing you mm. can do. So if you, you know, you hit that mulligan, you should, oh, you know, don't just right. ruminate on it because rumination is really a bad sure. thing. New swing uh, thought. New swing thought, new uh, motif. Uh, I'd say, you know, maybe walk around a mm -hmm. couple times. Right. <laughs> you know, get yourself into a new space and then it's a new world and then you can do it. Okay, so what is going on in a human when you have monkey brain days? Uh, your, your thoughts are scattered, you can't focus, you're completely discombobulated. Bobulated. Is that a word? Is that a word? It sure is, <laughs> okay. absolutely. So, you know, the way, to, the way I think of the cortex, actually, is I think of it as a sheet. You know, it's only two millimeters thick. And, you know, it's all crumpled up inside your head. Mm -hmm. But you could uncrumple it, then it'd be about this big. And when you have monkey brain, when you're thinking about a million different things, each one of those million things, it represents a little mountain of activity on your brain, right. on your cortex, right? And what you sometimes want is to kill all those little mountains and replace it with one big mountain, mm -hmm. what you're supposed to be thinking about, like yes, your golf be, swing, yes, for instance. Yes, be present. Be present, exactly. And we actually are learning. So imagine that, so how would you get from a million little mountains of activity on your cortex to one big mountain? Well, this is the way we do it. We actually, we all have attached to every one of those little mountains a hammer. Okay, mm -hmm. and what that hammer does is it tr it's trying to pound down all the other mountains. And the bigger the mountain, the bigger the hammer. So if the hammer, if, if you're having a day where your hammer's not very effective, <laughs> right. okay, then you're just gonna be left with all these little mountains mm -hmm. all trying to hit each other, but not very hard. But there are days and there are times when, you, when the hammer is very strong. And then if one mountain's only a little bit bigger than the other, than the others, it's gonna be a winner take all, because it's bigger, it's got a bigger hammer, it hammers down all the other ones, everybody's trying to ha hammer everybody mm -hmm. else, but if you got a really strong hammer, one is gonna win and gonna win fast. And that, we are now understanding what that hammer is actually made of mm -hmm. inside the brain. It is actually a neurotransmitter uh, that specializes <laughs> in inhibiting everybody who isn't me, mm -hmm. me, me, me. Mm -hmm. And so, your golf swing, and I think that's one thing that you really learn to control, you know? And you become the guy who can focus 150% on your golf mm -hmm. swing. No the matter what's happening. The danger of that is that if you're too much that kind of person, then do mm. you hear the word monomaniacal? I have heard that. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, there's a male brain and a female brain, as you know. Absolutely. And uh, it seems to me that the a male... female brain is just superior in every uh, way. I just give up right at the exactly. beginning. Exactly. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, to me, uh, men are a little more linear than we are. I don't know if it's yeah. true. Let's take a break. When we yeah. come back, you can address that. Okay. If you dare. I look forward to it. <laughs> okay. Dr. Max Sinatter, our guest. He's the director of the Brain Research Center at UBC.